Welcome everyone to another Sunday Night Live pre-recorded with a very favorite guest. Tonight we have Petra Meyer, who is one of my very favorite people on the planet. Now I know I say this all the time, but she is selfless, service, embodied. She is the president of the Blavatsky Lodge. She moved from Germany to London back in the 80s, I believe it was the 80s. And tonight's presentation, she's going to hit it out of the park again. Tonight we're going to be talking about the darkness of war and the Tao of peace. So before we get into that, I want to mention to you, we will be live in the comments section. Uh, although this has been pre-recorded, we actually ask you to participate. If you have any questions, drop a comment, drop a, a question as this is premiering, and we will always do our best to get back to you. Remember to like and subscribe, share this, because this is very valuable information. These are the textbooks for humanity. Taoism is the divine wisdom of ancient China. You would have heard of it. The transcendental source of all existence, which Lao Tzu called the Tao, manifesting with the two polar forces of yin and yang. So that's two polar forces of yin and yang, where each of the two poles is dynamically linked to the other. It is the cyclic passage of life as well as the ultimate goal for when the actor has vanished into the deed and the Tao alone is acting through us. That should sound very familiar. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Miss Petra Meyer. So we are talking about the darkness of war, the Tao of peace, and the power of Tai Chi. It was December 1914. The First World War was raging in Europe. It had started in July and was supposed to be over by Christmas. But due to unprecedented losses in several battles, the opposing sides were deadlocked and forced into a gruesome trench warfare that World War II became known for, claiming more than 15 million lives. But then for a short interlude on Christmas Eve in December 1914, an amazing episode happened in human history. Enemies who were just hours ago slaughtering each other at a level unseen in human history stopped the battle suddenly. It was a crisp and frosty morning when out of the blue thousands of British, Belgian and French soldiers put down their rifles, stepped out of their trenches and spent Christmas mingling with their German enemies along the Western Front in no man's land. How could that happen? A later document in the magazine Time contained a report by Graham Williams of the 5th London Rifle Brigade who described this event in some detail. On Christmas Eve, the Germans would sing one of their carols and then we would sing one of ours. Until when we started up, oh come all ye faithful, the Germans immediately joined in singing the same hymn to the Latin words Adeste Fidelis. And I thought, well, this is really a most extraordinary thing. Two nations both singing the same carol in the middle of a war. The next morning on Christmas Day, more German soldiers emerged from their trenches, calling out Merry Christmas in English. Allied soldiers came out verily to greet them. In other places, Germans held up signs reading, you not shoot, we not shoot. And over the course of the day, troops exchanged gifts of cigarettes, food, buttons, and hats. One British soldier, Murdoch M. Wood, speaking in 1930 to the New York Times, I then came to the conclusion, which I have held ever since firmly ever since, that if we had been left to ourselves, there would never have been another shot fired. And this is what some 6,000 years ago, the famous Chinese philosopher and founder of Taoism, Lao Tzu, said about the war. Weapons are the tools of fear. A decent man will avoid them, except in the direst necessity and if compelled, will use them only with the utmost restraint. Peace is its highest value. If the peace has been shattered, how can he be content? His enemies are not demons, but human beings like himself. He does not wish them personal harm. 
nor does he rejoice in victory. How could he rejoice in victory and delight in the slaughter of men? He enters a battle gravely, with sorrow and with great compassion, as if he were attending a funeral. What is the source of conflict and war according to theosophical teachings? The first war is the fall of spirit into generation, not the fall of mortal man, says the secret doctrine. The many wars in heaven refer to, a set, to several struggles of adjustment, spiritual, cosmical, and astronomical, but chiefly to the mystery of the evolution of man as he is now. The origin of the war in heaven and the fall has to be traced to India. The first happened in the night of time before the building of the solar system, symbolizing only the personified cosmic powers. Another one on earth as the creation of man. And a third war is mentioned as taking place at the close of the fourth race between its adepts and those of the fifth race between the initiates of the sacred island, a mysterious locality called Shambhala, which occultists place in the Malayas and the sorcerers of Atlantis. The fall of the angels and the war in heaven are repeated on every plane. The lower mirror disfigures the image of the superior mirror and each repeating it in its own way symbolizing the marriage of heaven with earth is the love of nature for divine form and the heavenly man enraptured with his own beauty mirrored in nature or spirit attracted into matter says the secret doctrine oriental traditions are as full of allegories about the downfall of pleroma which is the divine world or universal soul the world of the gods and divas one and all, they allegorized and explained the fall as the desire to learn and acquire knowledge, to know. This is a natural sequence of mental evolution. The spiritual becoming transmuted into the material or physical, the law of descent into materiality and reascend into spirituality. To become a self-conscious spirit, the latter must pass through every cycle of being culminating in its highest point on earth in man. Spirit per se is an unconscious negative abstraction. Its purity is inherent, not acquired by merit. To become the highest Yan Shuan or highest divine intelligence, it is necessary for each ego to attain to full self-consciousness as a human or a conscious being, which is synthesized in man. Honoring the creative powers in their multiple forms, no occultist or true philosopher accepted the allegory of the war in heaven as coming from the true spirit. Whether they regarded those living forces as living and conscious entities or not, they would never confuse the cause with the effect or accepting the spirit of the earth as Parabram or Ein Sof. They know that the soul of the astral light is divine and that only its body, the light waves on the lower planes, is infernal. This demon is Deus Inversus. Theosophy is the archaic wisdom religion, the esoteric doctrine once known in every ancient country having claims to civilization. This wisdom, all the old writings show us as an emanation of the divine principle, and the clear comprehension of it is typified in such name as the Indian Buddha, Toth of Memphis, the Hermes of Greece, etc. Under this designation, all the ancient philosophers of the East and West included all knowledge of things occult and essentially divine. According to Brahmanical calculation, the age of the world is divided into four yugas of different lengths, preceded by a twilight or transition period. We are currently living in the fourth one, Kal Yuga, or age of iron, 
darkness, misery, and sorrow. In the ocean of theosophy, Mr. Judge, who was one of the co-founders of the Theosophical Society, adds that the first 5,000 years of Kali Yuga will end between the years 1897 and 1898. This Yuga began about 3,102 years before the Christian era at the time of Krishna's death. As 1897, or 1898 are not far off, the scientific men of today will have an opportunity of seeing whether the close of the 5,000 year cycle will be preceded or followed by any convulsions or great changes, political, scientific, or physical, or all of these combined. Cyclic changes are now proceeding as year after year the souls from prior civilizations are being incarnated in this period, when liberty of thought and action are not so restricted in the West as they have been in the past by dogmatic religious prejudice and bigotry. And at the present time, we are in a cycle of transition, when, as a transition period should indicate, Everything in philosophy, religion, and society is changing. In a trans transition period, the full and complete figures and rules representing cycles are not given out to a generation which elevates money above all thoughts and scoff at the spiritual view of man and nature. In the introduction of the secret doctrine, it is mentioned that the collective researches of the Orientalists have come to the conclusion that an immense and incalculable number of manuscripts and even printed works known to have existed are not to be found anymore. They have disappeared without leaving the slightest trace behind them. Were they works of no importance, they might, in the natural course of time, have been left to perish, and their very names would have been obliterated from human memory. But this is not the case. It is now ascertained that most of these manuscripts contain the true keys to work still extant. Unfortunately, they are entirely incomprehensible for the greater portion of their readers without those additional volumes of commentaries and explanations. Such are, for instance, the works of Lao Tse. He is supposed to have written many books, but the heart of his doctrine is the Tao Te Ching, which today's scholars think was his only book. Madame Blavatsky cites the works of Stanislav Julian, a French sinologist, which is a student of Chinese language, literature, and history, who showed that the text of the Tao Te Ching had only about 5,000 words. Yet Professor Max Müller, a German-born philologist and orientalist, found that the text was still unintelligible without commentaries, so that Mr. Julian had to consult more than 60 commentators for the purpose of his translation. The earliest going far as far back as the year 163 BC, not earlier, and that during the four centuries and a half that preceded these earliest of the commentators, there was ample time to veil the true Lao Tzu doctrine from all but its initiated priests. It is widely accepted that much of the English translations of the Tao Te Ching can only render a small part of the rich and complex ideas contained in the original writing. That is why different translations of this book sometimes look as different texts. It would need a combination of all the translation to reveal the richness of the symbols in their original form. The teachings of the Tao Te Ching is moral in its deepest sense. Taoism is the divine wisdom of ancient Chinese origin about the transcendental source and oneness of all life, which is found in Lao Tzu called Tao and the importance of living in harmony with this source and substance of everything that exists and from which the power of Tai Chi originates. The Tao that can be told of is not the eternal Tao, 
The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The nameless is the origin of heaven and earth. The named is the mother of all things, says the Tao Te Ching. In his book, Taoism, J.C. Cooper wrote that the word Tao is always left untranslated as it is regarded as undefinable or to contain it in one word. By inference, it could be called the way. The ideograph is made up of the head or leader and the feet of progress by degrees. The two together giving the suggestion of intelligent movement along the way. It implies the whole man in conformity with the laws of nature. In the words of the secret doctrine, it sounds like this. In the Vedic sage Kapila's Sankhya philosophy, unless, allegorically speaking, Purusha sp or spirit mounts on the shoulders of Prakriti or matter, the latter remains irrational while the former remains inactive without her. Therefore, nature in man must become a compound of spirit and matter before he becomes what he is. And the spirit latent in matter must be awakened to life and consciousness gradually. For Lao Tse, <clears throat> the Tao was a transcendental cause, the primordial unity and all pervading principle of the universe, giving rise to it yet undiminished by it. It is called the absolute or ultimate reality. Some compare it to the Atman in Hinduism, the Suchness in Buddhism, the Ein Sof of the Kabbalah or the Monad of the Greeks. But even such definitions are misleading. In the Tao Te Ching it is said, the Tao that can be expressed is not the eternal Tao. It is beyond material existence. The Tao is a passage rather than the past. It is the spirit of cosmic change, the spirit of growth. It recoils upon itself like the dragon. It folds and unfolds as do the clouds. It is the eternal principle of all life, but no life can express it. Theosophy expresses it is like this. In occult metaphysics, there are properly speaking two ones. The one on the unreachable plane of absoluteness and infinity on which no speculation is possible. And the second one on the plane of emanations. The former can neither emanate nor be divided as it is eternal, absolute and immutable. The second being, so to speak, the reflection of the first one, for it is a logos or Ishvara in the universe of illusion, can do all this. The active is attracted by the passive principle and the great nag, the serpent emblem of the eternity, attracts its tail to its mouth, forming thereby a circle or cycles in eternity, in that incessant pursuit of the negative by the positive. Unconscious and non-existing when separated, they become consciousness and life when brought together. Hence again, Brahma from the root breathe the Sanskrit to expand, grow or to fructify, Brahma being but the vivifying expansive force of nature in its eternal evolution. The manifested world is transitory and in a perpetual state of flux according to Taoism. There is nothing fixed in the phenomenal world. All its possibilities are contained in growth and only growth can reveal life. The way is a way of life and can only be understood by being lived. That's why only a small amount of written material is left by Taoists. Life is not created, it is. Those who believe it possible to teach inspiration and genius to impose from without that can only be born from within are blind. Each must find in himself his own truth. Everything is unique through the essence of all things is one. In the relative world, it becomes every manifestation of the power of the universe, the power that gives rise to the mutable, 
The Tao is the way and the goal. According to theosophy, nature is never stationary during Manvantara. It is ever becoming, not simply being, and mineral, vegetable, and human life are always adapting their organisms to the then reigning elements. And therefore those elements were then fitted for them as I am now for the life of present humanity. We say and affirm that that motion, the universal perpetual motion which never ceases, never slackens, nor increases its speed, not even during the interludes between the Pralayas or Knights of Brahma, but goes on like a mill set in motion whether it has anything to grind or not. For the pralaya means a temporary loss of every form, but by no means the destruction of cosmic matter, which is eternal. We say that this perpetual motion is the only eternal and uncreated deity we are able to recognize, says the Mahatma Kutumi. Once we pass and thought from this to us absolute negation, duality supervenes in contrast of spirit, or consciousness and matter, subject and object. In the translation of the Tao Te Ching by Torbert McCarroll, this little book cannot be understood any more than you can understand a river. If you wish to experience the river, you must jump in. So it is with the Tao Te Ching. Many things in here will confuse you. The confusion is not to be conquered. It does not result from a lack of knowledge. This confusion is a teacher that can teach you about yourself, your story, your people, your world, and the still point of the universe to which we give the crude name, the Tao. There are no footnotes or commentaries here. These words of the Tao are to be hung like bells in your heart and rung by the motions we make as we move through our daily lives. Any other sound make it difficult to hear the bells. The Tao is universal. It is not Chinese. It is found in the quest of Christian mystics, Native Americans, Zen monks, desert holy people, and indeed in every culture and age in the story of the earth. Before this story began, and after it ends, there is a Tao. It consists of stillness and silence, and it will enter into any quiet heart. How can the divine wisdom of the Tao Te Ching assist us in our path to enlightenment in the 21st century? In his book, The Tao of Physics, Dr. Fritjof Capra, an Austrian-born American physicist, founding director of the Center of Ecoliteracy in Berkeley, California. Ecoliteracy is the ability to understand the natural systems that make life on Earth possible. And he says, Taoism is basically a way of liberation from this world and is, in this respect, comparable to the ways of yoga or Vedanta in Hinduism or to the Eightfold Paths of the Buddha. It is based on the firm belief that the human intellect can never comprehend the Tao. The Eastern mystics repeatedly insist on the fact that the ultimate reality can never be an object of reasoning or of demonstrable knowledge. It can never be adequately described by words because it lies beyond the realms of the senses and of the intellect from which our words and concepts are derived. The fact, which is obvious from any reading of the newspapers, that mankind has not become much wiser over the past 2000 years, in spite of a prodigious increase in rational knowledge, is ample evidence of the impossibility of communicating absolute knowledge by words. As Zhang Zhu, another influential Chinese philosopher and Taoist who lived around the fourth century BC said, if it could be talked about, everybody would have told their brother. Absolute knowledge is thus an entirely non-intellectual experience of reality, an experience arising in non-ordinary, the state of consciousness, which may be called a meditative or mystical state. 
that such a state exists had not only been testified by numerous mystics in the East and West, but is also indicated by psychological research. Zhang Zhu's book is full of passages reflecting the Taoist content of reasoning and argumentation. Just he says, a dog is not reckoned good because he barks well, or a man is not reckoned wise because he speaks skillfully. And that disputation is a proof of not seeing clearly. Logical reasoning was considered by the Taoists as part of the artificial world of man, together with social etiquette and moral standards. They were not interested in this world at all, but concentrated their attention fully on the observation of nature in order to discern the characteristics of the Tao. Thus, they developed an attitude which was essentially scientific, and only their deep mistrust in the analytic method prevented them from constructing proper scientific theories. The careful observation of nature, combined with a strong mystical intuition, led the Taoist sages to profound insights, which are confirmed by modern scientific theories, says Dr. Capra. One of the most important insights of the Taoist was the realization that transformation and change are essential features of nature. They saw all changes in nature as manifestations of the dynamic interplay between the polar opposites of yin and yang. And thus they came to believe that any pair of opposites constitutes a polar relationship where each of the two poles is dynamically linked to the other. Dr. Capra also points out that at the same time when Laozi and his followers developed their worldview, the essential features of this Taoist view were also taught in Greece by a man whose teachings are known to us only in fragments and who was and still is very mis often misunderstood. This Greek Taoist was Heraclitus of Ephesus. He shared with Laozi not only the emphasis on continuous change, which he expressed in his famous saying, everything flows, but also the notion that all changes are cyclical. It is easy to see how the concept of change as a dynamic interplay of opposites led Heraclitus, like Laozi, to the discovery that all opposites are polar and thus united. Heraclitus is often mentioned in connection with modern physics but hardly ever in connection with Taoism. And yet it is this connection which shows best that his worldview was that of a mystic. And thus puts the parallels between his ideas and those of modern physics in the right perspective. When we talk about the Taoist concept of change, it is important to realize that this change is not seen as occurring as a consequence of some force, but rather it is as a tendency which is innate in all things and situations. The movement of the Tao are not forced upon it, but occur naturally and spontaneously. Theosophy would describe this process as a law of karma. This law, whether conscious or unconscious, predestines nothing and no one. It exists from and in eternity truly, for it is eternity itself. And as such, it cannot be said to act, for it is action itself. Karma creates nothing, nor does it design. It is man who plants and creates causes. And karmic law adjusts the effects, which adjustment is not an act, but universal harmony tending ever to resume its original position. Karma has never sought to destroy intellectual and individual liberty, like the God invented by the monotheists. Karma is an absolute and eternal law in the world of manifestation. And as there can be only one absolute or one eternal ever-present cause, believers in karma cannot be regarded as atheists or materialists, still less as fatalist, for karma is one with the unknowable, of which it is an aspect in its effect in the phenomenal world. What is the power of Tai Chi? 
How is it connected with Taoism? How can it be? How can it assist us on our path to wisdom and health? As we had heard before about Lao Tzu and the Tao, Tai Chi is a deeply spiritual discipline for body, mind, and spirit. Developed in the philosophical schools of China during the sixth century BC, Tai Chi is based on the philosophy of the great sage Lao Tzu a name which literally means the old master. He was an older contemporary of Confucius. The classical Chinese words were, as we have heard before, rather sound symbols with strong suggestive powers. It was not meant to express an intellectual idea, but rather to affect the inner faculties of a listener to the suggestive power of the word in question. Similar to the Sanskrit language where letters are continually arranged in the sacred olas or symbols so that they may become musical notes, says Madame Blavatsky in her collected writings. For the whole Sanskrit alphabet and the Vedas from the first word to the last are musical notations reduced to writing. The two are inseparable. As Homer distinguished between the language of the gods and the language of men, so did the Hindus, the Devanagari, the Sanskrit characters are the speech of the gods or the divine. And Sanskrit is a divine language or expression. The Chinese, like the Indians, believed that there is an ultimate reality which underlies and unifies everything in the universe. As we have heard, they called this reality Tao, the undefinable reality and it is the equivalent of the Hinduist Brahman, though the Tao has a more intrinsically dynamic quality. It is a cosmic process in which all things are involved, a continuous flow of change. The idea is that all developments in nature, are well, as well as those of human situations, so show cyclical patterns of coming and going, of expansion and extraction. It is an introduction of the polar opposites of yin, feminine, and yang, masculine, which sets limits to the cycles of change. People very often think that Lao Tzu was a hermit dwelling in the mountains, but it is clear from his teachings that he deeply cared about society and the welfare of human beings. His book is a treatise on right government of everything in life. A misconception may arise from his teaching of why wu why, literally meaning doing, not doing, which is seen as passivity, but nothing could be further from the truth. A good athlete, for example, can enter a state of body awareness in which the right movement happens effortlessly, effortless by itself without the inference of the con conscious will. That is what is meant by non-action, which often sounds very paradoxical. Like when Lao Tzu says, less and less do you need to fall to four things until finally you arrive at non-action because the Tao is acting through us, which means that the doer has wholeheartedly vanished into the deed itself. Or when the fuel has been completely transformed into the flame, it happens when we trust the intelligence of the universe in the same way as a dancer trusts the intrinsic intelligence of the body. That is why Lao Tzu emphasized is on softness, the opposite of rigidity, synonymous with adaptability and endurance. Everybody who has watched a Tai Chi master doing, not doing, will experience how powerful the softness is. In Lao Tzu's philosophy is the potential figure of a man or woman whose life is in perfect harmony with the way things are, having mastered the laws of nature, not in the sense of conquering them, but by surrendering to the Tao, the essence of the universe, by giving up all human concepts, judgments and desires, the mind will grow naturally compassionate finding deep within our own experiences the central truths of the art of right living, 
which sounds paradoxical, only on the surface of things. The clearer your, our insight into what is beyond good and evil, the more we can embody the good until the mind finally can say in all humility, I am the Tao, the truth, the life. The master does not see evil as a force which needs resistance but as a state of self-absorption which is in disharmony with the process in which the universe unfolds. The freedom from moral categories allows him his great compassion even for the wicked and the selfish. This master is available to all people and does not reject anyone. He is ready to use all situations and does not waste anything. This is called embodying of light. Being and non-being create each other. Difficulty and easy support each other. Long and short define each other. Before and after follow each other. Therefore the master acts without anything, doing anything, and teaches without saying anything. Things arise and he lets them come. Things disappear and he lets them go. He has, but he does not possess. Acts, but does not expect. When his work is done, he forgets it. That is why he lasts forever. Tai Chi Chuan, casually referred to as Tai Chi, is a unique, deep, meditative, internal Chinese philosophy with a martial art at its core which has been developed over many centuries. It, its calisthenic or kind of gymnastic exercises can be viewed in the wide context of traditional Chinese medicine, the meridian system of acupuncture, psychology, breathing exercise and meditation. It is a health science which acts both on the mind and body by improving physical equilibrium and strength, blood circulation, right breathing, concentration, peace of mind, and the skills of self-defense. With other words, it is a holistic system of self-cultivation, a cultural masterpiece developed in the monasteries of China. Virtually an esoteric school until the mid-19th century, it was only available with the monasteries and temple schools. Because of many generous teachers, this spiritual treasure is now also available in the Western world and has enriched the lives of many people. Millions of them practice it daily around the globe, but most of them don't know what the term Tai Chi Chuan really means. The popular translation is grand ultimate fist, but when asked what that exactly means, most students are lost to come up with a proper explanation. Tai Chi is an important term used in Taoist philosophy. In its original cosmic sense, as we have heard before, the Tao is the ultimate undefinable reality, the equivalent of the Hindu Brahman, the essence of the cosmic process in which all things are involved, a continuous flow and change, including human situations, a cyclic pattern of coming and going, of expansion and contraction, symbolized by the dynamic interplay of the polar signs yin and yang. That which lets now the dark, now the light appear is Tao, says the aging of changes, which also symbolizes the male and female forces in nature. Yang is a strong male creative power, yin the dark receptive female material maternal element representing the earth. The I Ching, a book of changes, is a book thousands of years old. In China, it has served as an all-encompassing philosophical treatise of the universe, a guide towards ethical living, a guidebook for ruling, and as an oracle for one's personal life and psychic future. The two most major branches of Chinese philosophy, Confucianism and Taoism, all oh, their creation to this ancient fundamental book. It is one of the first efforts of the human mind 
to place itself within the universe and interest in it has been rapidly growing in the West. The symbol of yang and yin is well known the world over. The two dots in the diagram symbolize the idea that each time one of the two reaches its extreme, it contains in itself already the seed of the opposite. That is why traditional Chinese medicine is also based on the balance of yin and yang in the human body. Any illness is seen as a disruption of this balance. The observation that mind and body are intimately linked, that the mind directly affects the body, made it obvious that anxiety, stress, fear, etc., are the causes of tension, disease or sickness, interfering with proper breathing, circulating of energies, and general body functions. An active but peaceful mind was recognized as an absolute necessity to health a balanced personality, and an efficient body. Therapeutic exercises were developed, imitating the flight of birds and other animal movements, as well as their sounds, due to their unself-conscious naturalness forming the basis of their dances. Dr. Fritjof Kapra compares the Tao in his book, The Tao of Physics, with the intrinsic motion of the subatomic world the indivisible dynamic whole whose parts are essentially interrelated and can only be understood as patterns of cosmic process. Where this interrelation and interaction between the parts of the whole are more fundamental than the parts themselves. And he expressed this process with the following beautiful words. There is motion, but there are ultimately no moving objects. There is activity, but there are no actors. There are no dancers. There's only the dance. In the Mahatma letters, as we have heard before, the Mahatma Kutumi confirms as well that motion, the universal perpetual motion, which never ceases, never slackens, nor increases its speed, not even during the interludes between the pralayas or nights of Brahman, but go on like a mill set in motion, whether it has anything to grind or not. For the pralaya means a temporary loss of every form, but by no means the destruction of cosmic matter, which is eternal. We say this perpetual motion is the only eternal and uncreated deity we are able to recognize. Taoism aimed to attain complete union with Tao the unnameable essence of all being by practicing and imitating this flow of energy to attain inner stillness, finer mental focus, harmony and flowing with the process of life. Body movements were coordinated with yogic breathing exercises with an ever growing knowledge of the subtle or esoteric anatomy of the body and the balancing of these movements of energy which they call chi. It is the equivalent of prana or the life principle in Sanskrit. <laughs> Within these movements are naturally concealed the exercises of un unarmed combat, which is a heritage of Chinese culture. They were largely evolved by physicians and taught in little schools attached to their practices for the aim was preventative medicine. The physicians were not paid if those under their care became ill. In the monasteries and temple schools, monks were not only concerned with improving and preserving the quality of life, but also to develop some skills in self-defense without the use of weapons, which they were not permitted to use. In this way, Chuan exercise were evolved. And this term literally means fist in the sense that it actually symbolizes a nucleus of focus of concentrated energy for controlling one's temporal nature, a tool for mastering the mind, emotions, and body, the skill of self-defense, as well as health-giving therapies. In early Chinese concepts, Tai Chi was seen as a horizontal pole, the link or bridge between heaven and earth the macrocosm embracing within itself the constant cyclic movement, 
law of periodicity between the complementary polarities of yin and yang, subject and object. The art of Tai Chi is aiming for the integration and complete mastery of the whole individuality, balancing all energies of the personality and the spirit, opening up of the higher spiritual faculties like inspiration, intuition, and divine will. It is a process of self-realization, opening up the way which goes beyond the lower or reasoning mind to the intuitive or higher mind, which requires many lifetimes to achieve. The union with Tao or our divine source. The movements of Tai Chi are the constant shifting of energies between the two opposite poles or polarities in space. The mind remaining tra tranquility as a coordinating factor and observer. As with the legs, the arms and hands express the alternations of yin and yang as well, curving and pressing through space like swimming in air. These movements flow from the center of the body called Dantian, two fingers before, below the label. It is the energy center of chi or life, one of the focal points for meditation, exercise techniques, and traditional Chinese medicine. Through this area within the auric or electromagnetic energy field, energies are passed through the body and distributed according to needs. In heightened awareness, the body and atmosphere are finally experienced as a pair of complementary opposites or an integral part of each other, which will finally be experienced as the essence of unconditioned love. Tai Chi cannot be developed, it simply is. And the aim is to focus its energies to maintain the appropriate rate of vibration or flow throughout our whole constitution. The movements need to be consciously felt with the movement of life, grass waving in the breeze, clouds flowing across the sky, ebb and flow of the tidal waves of the sea, cleansing and purifying with the fire of life, the soil for the seeds of a new healthy life of body, mind and spirit. The raising of vibrations in the whole constitution of man is a very important healing process. The peak experience of Tai Chi Chuan the emptying of self to allow the attainment of integrated unity, the emergence of what is called Te in Chinese philosophy, which is virtue or power, intrinsic in primordial nature. It is an inner quality existing in all creatures and things, a manifestation of Tao. The sage Zhuang Tzu, a Taoist philosopher and greatest disciple of Lao Tzu once said, to the mind that is still, the whole universe surrenders. As a spiritual progression, Tai Chi symbolizes the moment of birth, the emergence from Tao, the source, into Tai Chi, the one as a polarized movement of yin and yang or unity manifesting as diversity, activated by Qi or life force, ultimately leading to reunion with Tao again through the growth and awareness of the one life. A release from the cycles of rebirth into physical existence. The teachers tell us that Tai Chi cannot be learned from books. Swami Vishnu Devananda, founder of the International Shivagan Shivananda Yoga Vedanta centers and ashrams in the last century once said, one can become a teacher very easily. To become a student takes a whole lifetime. The easiest thing in the world is to teach something one does not know or practice. The most difficult of all things is to practice what one preaches. So that she is the art of self-cultivation. If you close your mind in judgments and traffic with desires, your heart will be troubled. If you keep your mind from judging and aren't led by the senses, your heart will find peace. Use your own light and return to the source of light 
This is called practicing eternity. A great nation is like a great man. When he makes a mistake, he realizes it. Having realized it, he admits it. Having admitted it, he corrects it. He considers those who point out his faults as his most benevolent teachers. He thinks of his enemy as a shadow that he himself casts. I have just three things to teach. Simplicity, patience, compassion. These three are your greatest treasures. Simple in action and in thought, you return to the source of being. Patient with both friends and enemies, you accord with the way things are. Compassionate towards yourself, you reconcile all beings in the world. A journey of a thousand miles must begin with a single step, said Lao Tzu. So. Oh, thank you so, so much. So beautiful. Thank you, Miss Petpa. <laughs> oh, you are welcome. <laughs> that was amazing. The similarities, as you see, as you speak about this, it looks so familiar, does it not? All of them yeah. ringing true. They all said the same thing, didn't they? Yes. So we see it comes all from the same source. You know, when you compare it with theosophy, Everybody expresses this a little bit differently. In essence, it is all the same and it is thousands and thousands of years old. Thank you for the, that work because many people think, I guess, maybe it's a human thing, is that ours is the only way. And I think yeah. that's a mistake that we've made for far too long. Mm -hmm. Looking at this Eastern meets Western, then you can see the Indian coming in, you can see all of it coming in. Yeah. And as you look at it, there's so many things that you mentioned in there that I can see are, are literally, they're parallel sayings. They are parallel, as if it yeah. was just a, uh, you know, just the words were switched around a little bit. Well, what a beautiful thing when you spoke about the uh, the peaceful, what was it the peaceful pose of power? It was, uh, that, that's mind blowing. I was thinking about Tai Chi also being like a yoga of sorts, perhaps. Yeah. It, it seems to be synonymous. Yeah, well, it is a bit like uh, when we talked about uh, Zoroaster. Or, yeah. You know, um, I want to um, make people aware a bit that all these ancient teachings are coming from the same source. And when we know about Theosophy and the secret doctrine, uh, because Madame Blavatsky is always talking and making all these comparisons with all kinds of philosophies and religions. Um, it is all from the same source. And uh, the more we uh, look at different aspects, the more we realize um, what a wonderful tool we have to uh, improve our lives, you know. Yes. Yes, if the you way of life. or meditation or whatever, um, it uh, triggers our intuition. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. It's the way of living. You mentioned that the Tao yeah. is the way, and we talk about when people ask what is theosophy. I said it's a way of living. Yeah. Um, and that's how I try to describe it. And then you mentioned at the very end there, or near the end, which is so important, which is. We hear the phrase "practice what you preach," but uh, "practice what you teach" um, <laughs> is how how beautiful that was when it was talked about. It's easy to be a teacher to teach something you don't do. It yeah, takes yeah. a long time to actually be a student, yeah. and that was so well put because that's what we all are: is simply students of these ancient teachings that yeah. are all. That, that if you listen and look, no matter what it is, you can look at the Kabbalah, you can look at the alchemists, you can look at the Masons. You can, especially you talked about the American Indians. Um, they all talked about honoring nature and it is compassion. And you mentioned simplicity and patience, all of those beautiful traits that if you are watching this and you want to go ahead and try to find out more, it's not gonna come from anywhere else. It's gonna come from inside you. Yeah. And you can take these teachings and do with them what you will. You never have to darken this YouTube channel again. The most important thing is you can apply them, become them, and that's where the change takes place. Yeah. So um, it is so important to remind people that all these native people uh, have never lost its connection to uh, 
the forces of nature, you know, they can connect to it. Like what when I talked yesterday about the sound, they now know to produce these sounds which have an effect um, on our physical constitution. I just spoke to a friend uh, just the other day about sound and she said, you have to talk to my partner because uh, he's a musician. Mm. And we talked a bit about it and he said he spent uh, three months with the Aborigines in um, Australia. And he said they are so close to nature and the sounds of nature is unbelievable. He said they were crossing a river with 20 of them mm -hmm. and one slipped on a stone and really twisted his ankle terribly. And they picked him up, took him on the other side and they um, formed a circle around him. And they started to um, produce some certain vibrations of music of, well, music is vibrations, mm -hmm. but a certain uh, scale of music. And he said, if I wouldn't have seen it myself, the anchor started to form itself back and healed. And after, I don't know how long, an hour or so, this guy could stand up and walk again. Oh my God. It was all due to the vibrations they produced on a certain frequency. And this and was with their voices, their voices? Yes, with their voices, they produced these um, sounds. And uh, he said, well, you can tell people and they hardly believe it. But he yeah, said, yeah. I was there, I saw it. Oh. And probably if I wouldn't have been there, yeah. I wouldn't have believed it. But it happened in front of my eyes. Oh, see, those are the, the latent powers in man, all the things yes. that we don't really realize that we're capable of. It's very true. What she's saying is unless you experience it, it's all woo woo until it happens to you, you. Yes. And then when it happens to you, then you're like, how would I tell my friends about this? That's the thing. You must have the experience yourself. So that's why we yeah. talk about this is based on fact, not just stories, not just faith and belief and hope in something that doesn't exist. It's your own personal experience. And what a beautiful story that is. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Won't it be wonderful when humanity starts to truly understand who we are, why we're here, where we're going and what we're doing, and we can actually become that change uh, that we wish to see. And that's why we share these teachings. That's why we show up. Now, Petra had a huge talk. She's been talking all the time, always presenting <laughs> these teachings, um, and she puts them together brilliantly. She does not like fanfare and she does not like credit. And what we are, both of us, all of us, any of us, we're all just students on the path exactly, of sharing, exactly. sharing our, yeah, yeah what we're just practicing. sharing information. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, some people are just starting, some people have just heard about it. When you have done it for over 40 years, you have more information and that is what you would like to share, you know, and then everybody can make their own uh, interpretation. <laughs> And um, so grateful, so grateful that you shared on the Tao tonight because we we talk about the parallel sayings, but many uh, theosophy things are too many. I think are too uh, solely theosophical. If we look out the whole thing, it says to compare the world's religions, sciences, and philosophies, and look for the commonalities. Yeah. Every slide you hit on there was synonymous. And so uh, go to where your heart feels. If you're watching this, go to where your heart feels. Thank you for your comments and thank you for participating in the, in the chat. Uh, thank you to you, Petra, for oh, all that you welcome. are and do. It's <laughs> true. We are so grateful for you. Oh, and thank, um, you very much. <laughs> thank you. Again, this is about the darkness of war. Beautiful story to kick it off. Again, the darkness of war. This is somebody else's issue and we're losing. We yes. literally fighting and fighting and fighting. It's never, we've tried that, okay? We've tried that for centuries and millennia, we have fought. Mm -hmm. Let us try something different. And what those boys did on that battlefield when they saw the commonalities, they were singing the same song. We too are singing the same song and then arguing about which one is the best song. We can be like those boys on that battlefield in 1914. I think that that's something I'd like to see us do. What a touching story. Thank you so much. It's not a story, it's a truth. It uh, really yes. happened. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, what are they doing out there? What are they doing? They're mm -hmm. fighting somebody else's issue, somebody else's war based on yes. the Lord itself. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we can just yeah. get to work by becoming these teachings. I am so truly grateful for you and for all of you out there watching as well. Thank you for being a part of this. 
And Ms. Petra, I know you've talked and talked and talked for hours over the last couple of days. <laughs> and I'm lucky enough to be able to study with you on, on Thursdays in the Secret yes. Doctrine. Again, that's what we study this. Um, this is uh, the Secret Doctrine. Petra, would you like to give a one sentence summary of this phenomenal text? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is um, based on the book of Zian, one of the most ancient scriptures uh, available. And uh, only 14 stanzas, I think uh, seven in um, and, um, Cosmogenesis and seven in anthrop uh, Anthropogenesis are given out. That is only what we can understand now. There are plenty of more stanzas as HBB, but we couldn't comprehend them. <laughs> and uh, she probably wouldn't have been able to. And um, that is what uh, we do um, in our presentations. She compares, first she gives commentaries and then she compares it with all kinds of philosophies, religions, science. And um, it is such a rich source of information. And it is not easy, you know, it is um, better to study it in a group. Mm -hmm. Everybody can see it from different aspects or have different information. And uh, it is very valuable if we have a group of people who tackle it yeah. <laughs> together. Yeah, together. <laughs> bounce it around. And yeah. I was going to say, if any of you are interested um, on this channel for free, I have voiced uh, Voice of the Silence and Light on the Path, which was my introduction to lead me to the secret doctrine and several other people, the secret doctrine, and other people have been led into that as well. It's, uh, they're a little bit smaller. Um, the Voice of the Silence is a very powerful text, uh, but um, just spend time with it, listen to it, see what you think. Uh, if you're looking to learn more and then follow your nose, Google it. You don't have to listen to it from us, but Google this if this sounds mm -hmm. interesting to you, uh, mm -hmm. because I believe that by getting that out there into the world, wherever this is going to go, wherever other students are carrying this forward, I believe it will unite the world. I believe in, I have hope for humanity. Yeah, I do. well, there are also um, some helpful introductions to the secret doctrine, which HBB has written herself, like the key to theosophy. Oh, yes. It the key theosophy, yeah. Very helpful, yeah. Yeah, so there's many, the texts are out there. Many of them are available for free uh, via PDF online. Mm -hmm. So you have the world's libraries at your fingertips. So you could be watching Netflix or you could maybe, you could do both. Watch Netflix, then Google, uh, and try to find these these things. Now that we're all online, now that the, the COVID, we started this a uh, year ago almost, and now everybody's online and the world is changing. So use this yeah, online source that connects the world to find your answers or find your questions, whichever one. Sometimes we come away with more questions than answers. Oh, most yes. <laughs> yeah, most of the time you go, wait a minute, I know less than I did when I woke up this morning. So I love you, sweetheart. Thank you so, so much. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs>